the Mega Drive is getting so many new games lately and the trend continues with another release from Spanish developer Kai Magazine Software. I've reviewed two of their games before, Metal Dragon, a top-down run and gun similar to Commando or Mercs, and Life on Mars, a platform shooter with Metroidvania gameplay mechanics. Their latest game is Life on Earth Reimagined, set in the same narrative universe as Life on Mars. As with their previous two games, this is a Mega Drive remake of the MSX original from 2017. Thanks, or muchas gracias, to Kai Magazine Software for sending over an early copy for review. Before we get into the game, let's have a quick look at the packaging. The cover art is not exactly subtle, is it? The slipcover is reversible, so classic PAL Mega Drive on one side and blue spine on the other. If you order a copy on their website, link below, you can choose between these two versions, Japanese Mega Drive or Sega Genesis. Inside we have the car, of course, some postcards depicting pixel art from the game. Look at that, lovely. I do love a bit of pixel art. And then we have a nice glossy manual, well printed. This tells you vital information about the game, particularly some of the extra moves the player can perform, which will be essential for progressing, so don't skip the manual. Life on Earth is, I suppose, a platform run and gun. There's a lot of running and plenty of gunning, but don't discount the platform part of that description, because there's a good dollop of platforming in this game, and it can be fiendishly tricky. You play as this generously bosomed young lady called Zira Kantara. It's raining love, put a bloody coat on. She's actually a doctor which makes this outfit even more bizarre. I wonder in which field she received her PhD, biochemistry maybe? The story as outlined in this rather nicely animated intro starts with the protagonist's team in their lab, studying one of two samples of alien bacteria found on Mars. As I said, this ties in with the story of life on Mars. Some of the personnel get infected and start to show some worrying symptoms, including superhuman strength and fierce rage. Eventually they fully mutate and kill almost all of the people in the facility. The protagonist manages to escape after destroying the lab, but is unfortunately herself infected by the bacteria. Before she offs herself, Zero must hunt down and destroy the other alien sample to prevent human extinction. Problem is, after she blew up her lab, she's wanted as a suspected terrorist and mass murderer by the authorities. The first thing I thought when I played this for the first time when seeing this first level was how arcadey it seems when compared to life on Mars. It reminded me of a cross between Shinobi and Robocop. The developers have said that Life on Earth is a mix of Contra, Shinobi 3 and Rolling Thunder in a cyberpunk setting, and I think that's an accurate description. Before we get too far into looking at the gameplay, I'll just explain the controls and those essential moves I referred to. There are two control layouts, but I'm playing on normal, which uses A for physical attacks, B to shoot and C for jump. The fire button can be pressed manually or held down for a continuous burst. You can shoot in seven directions, which is the usual eight directions excluding straight down. Hold up and press jump to perform a higher jump, and press down and jump to jump down from platforms. The physical close quarters attacks can be executed manually by pressing A, but they're also automatically performed if you're near enough to an enemy and pressing the fire button. Don't sleep on those melee attacks. Zira is mutating due to the alien bacteria, so her melee attacks are very powerful and will prove invaluable in the game. Double tap the D-pad in a direction to run. You can then do a running attack at enemies. If you double tap to run and then jump, you'll jump further, which is useful for some platforming sections. There's also a flying kick move that's performed in the air by pressing down or diagonally down and jump. This is handy for attacks, but again, also absolutely vital for clearing some of the platforming sections. The options on the game's menu lets you choose between three game modes. The easy, normal and hard modes are three difficulty levels of the regular game, with each difficulty varying the damage enemies deal, their health and the effectiveness of the small health pickups you collect. Each continue gives you three lives, and extra lives are awarded every 25,000 points until you hit 300,000. When you die, you'll reset back to the start of the section you're on, and each level can be split into several sections. Then there's arcade mode with one hit deaths, but you respawn where you died and have infinite ammo. And heroic mode where you only have one life, but plenty of health, 
but the enemies also have a lot of health and again infinite ammo. The options also let you choose between the two button layouts and view extras that you can unlock as you complete certain in-game challenges. So let's get to the nitty gritty, the game itself. I have quite mixed feelings about this game and I'll explain why as we go, but it starts off really strong. As I mentioned, the first stage really reminded me of Robocop at the arcade, and that's even before you get to the first boss, which looks like a cross between ED-209 and an ATST. The presentation is spot on with the dystopian future cyberpunk vibe. Absolutely love the visuals here and the bleak colour palette with accents of vibrant red signage or the glowing city lit up in the background. Looks great. Another fantastic aspect of the overall vibe of the game is the soundtrack composed by Savage Regime who has created a lot of great Mega Drive music including the soundtracks for Xeno Crisis and Astabros. Here, Savage Regime is on top form as always, providing music that hits hard and adds to the chaos and urgency of the gameplay while feeling distinctly Mega Drive. The sound effects are hit and miss, with a lot of them lacking in weight in terms of punchiness and volume. A bit more wallop would have been nice. Pickups are either health top ups or weapons. Zero is armed with an energy rifle with infinite ammo, but there are three special weapons. Triple Shot, which is a spread shot with quite limited range, Auto Shot, which fires a stream of powerful projectiles, and Explosive Shot, which fires huge projectiles that explode on impact, causing massive damage. When you collect one of the three special shot power-ups, it's not replacing one you may already have equipped, you can have all of them equipped at once. The power-ups are essentially just ammo for these weapons, and you can switch between them on the fly. Press start to switch between these, or if on a 6 button pad you can press X, Y and Z, each of which is a different weapon. As the start button is taken up by this weapon switching, you'll need to hold start to pause the game. When you run out of ammo of one weapon, it'll automatically switch to another of your special weapons, or in the case you've run out of them all, it'll just go back to your regular shot. You can hold down fire to continuously shoot, but it is a lot faster to mash the fire button, so that's advisable especially when there are a lot of enemies approaching. Health top-ups are either small or large. Large ones will replenish 25 points out of your max health of 99. Small ones dropped mainly by defeated robots will replenish a set amount which varies according to the difficulty. I think normal is 5 HP. At the end of each stage you get a bit of story progression. Like the intro, these are superbly drawn. The second level completely switches things up in true 16-bit style and gives you a side-scrolling shooter section on a motorbike. The mechanics are similar in principle to the main game, you're running and gunning, but on wheels. You have the same shot and weapon upgrades as you do on foot, and your punch attack now engages an electric attack at the front of the bike for bashing enemies. It's quite short and easy, but the scenery looks wonderful and there's some good old parallax scrolling to enjoy. The next stage takes you back to the city, but there's some beautiful cherry blossoms or sakura to admire. Honestly, I think the graphics peak with these early stages, not to say the rest of the game looks bad, that's not the case at all, just that this scenery is arguably the most striking. There's a decent mix of enemies in the game, some of which are also used in Life on Mars. These can be human, robots, airborne drones, mutants, and they all have behaviours that you can learn and exploit. Some fire projectiles, so learning when and at what angle will help you. Some charge at you, some are particularly vulnerable to your close quarters attacks. That's really the most important thing with this game, learn the enemies and learn the levels, because without that you're absolutely going to fail. It's all about skill and memorization hand in hand. This game gets insanely hard. And also make plenty of use of that close quarters melee attack because that's extremely powerful. After the Cherry Blossom stage you get the first of these modular mechanical bosses where you need to destroy all three parts separately. Then this level, which is more reminiscent of Life on Mars where you're in a research facility. This is more maze-like in structure and starts to introduce some more platforming elements to the game. Enjoy this level and this pace while you can because things are about to get real. This is where the facility starts to blow up and you have to make a run for it. This is absolutely mental, and if I had any hair, I would have pulled it out while attempting this level. The setup is that the explosion is racing towards you from the left of the screen as it automatically scrolls. You have to outrun it like some kind of 80s action movie star. 
it scrolls so fast that you actually have to use the double tap to run, and even then you have to perform a huge series of pinpoint accurate moves. No stopping to shoot because you'll die, so you need to use that punch attack as you run. Get hit by an enemy and you'll die, because there's not enough time to recover. Then there's the insanely precise platforming jumps to make, all of which you need to know the exact location of beforehand, as there's not enough time for you to see them coming. If that wasn't all bad enough, sometimes it's just luck as to whether or not you get shot by an enemy. So frustrating. Let me just quickly watch the footage and count how many times I died before I finally completed this level. 104 times. I died 104 times. It was painful, let me tell you. And the devs told me that the game is designed to be completed in one continue. Ha! You'd have to be Rain Man to do this in one continue. I used 34 continues on this one level. I'll play my successful run of this level now so you can see how precise it is and bear in mind that any contact with any enemy, any shot or any misjump will likely result in failure. I feel like you really have to have a certain personality to enjoy levels like this and believe me I don't have it. The next stage takes us back to the bright lights of the city at night but this time we're above it, leaping between flying vehicles. This level was fairer but still really difficult. Not only do you have to learn the enemy locations and attack patterns precisely because any shot you take could send you flying off the platform to your death, but also the platforms seem to suddenly allow the player character to fall through. I wasn't sure if this was a design choice or a bug at first, but I think it's the former. Basically, you can walk on these flying vehicles, but often if you backtrack, you'll just fall through completely and drop to your death. I found that jumping rather than walking eliminates this risk. At the end of this stage, there's a huge jump, and it took me ages to work out what to do here as there's no clear instruction. A lot of the jumps in the game are quite blind, actually. You can hold down diagonally to sort of look down a bit, so you can get an idea of any platforms below, but this one I had no idea what to do. I tried several jumps, even running jumps, but none got me there. What was the solution in the end was to do a jump from this platform, then immediately perform the down and jump flying kick move I mentioned earlier. Damn hard level, and it took me over an hour to finally finish it. After another boss, you get another motorbike level. This one isn't quite the bit of respite the first one was, as this time the difficulty is cranked up a fair notch but nothing that a few tries won't overcome. The next couple of levels are pretty hard, but memorization and perseverance will see you through. Then we get a variation on the scrolling shooter segments, this time using a jetpack. I quite like this, it's a nice change of pace, not only because it's like a scrolling shooter, but it's a bit less punishing. Unfortunately, that slightly more chilled pace is luring you into a full sense of security, because the next two levels are absolutely brutal. These are basically a non-stop onslaught of enemies where you have to keep pushing on forward, faced with wave after wave of them. I managed to get through the first section after many attempts, but the next one is as far as I've got. Let me play you a bit to show just how hard this is.
And that's where I sort of gave up. I just couldn't do it. I thought, hey, I'll restart and play it through again on easy so I have more of a chance when I get to that level. But then I got to this accursed stage and honestly, I didn't have the heart to go through it again just yet. Easy mode doesn't really help when the screen is scrolling and you can't make any mistakes. So sorry folks, I haven't actually completed the game yet, but I will be going back to it and trying again. One handy feature is that the game lets you continue where you left off from the main menu. It saves automatically every time you beat a boss. So next time I boot up Life on Earth, I'll be starting at this stage again. Sadly, easy mode doesn't let you see the whole game through to the end. So hopefully you understand now why I said at the beginning that I have mixed feelings about Life on Earth. On the whole, it's really awesome. The presentation, music and gameplay are all really well executed, but some of the design choices just felt a bit unfair and frustrating to me. But maybe that's more to do with my personality rather than the fault of the game. I'm sure there are many people out there who will relish the challenge this game offers. And in fairness, Mega Drive run and gun games back in the 90s weren't exactly easy, were they? Thanks again to Kai Magazine Software for sending it over. Link is in the description if you want to grab yourself a copy, as is a link to Savage Regime's YouTube channel if you want to check out some more of his Mega Drive music. Let me know what you think of Life on Earth so far in the comments, and let me know if you'll be grabbing a copy. I'll be back with some more Mega Drive stuff very soon, got a few things cooking. I'll leave you with a bit of gameplay without me talking over it. Thanks for watching.